And uh, the outlines of this talk will be the hemodynamic components. Again, we've been through this before yesterday. Uh, we're talking about the indications uh, of advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about the non-invasive methods, namely the esophageal Doppler monitor and the echocardiography. And then we'll spend most of the talk, uh, then we'll stop. And the last part of the talk will be about the invasive and less invasive hemodynamics assessment using PA catheter, transponator dilution, um, or um, let go or indicator dilution method. So the objectives uh, we would like to know about the minimally invasive tools for hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, when can we use these tools? What do we mean by invasive tools of hemodynamic monitoring? What are the indications for the invasive tools? And then what do we mean by transpulmonary thermal dilution, the indications for transpulmonary thermal dilution, the components of the kit, the principles used in transpulmonary thermal dilution, and also to know some limitations of these devices. Starting with the hemodynamic component, we've seen this slide yesterday, and it's really important to know that when we do hemodynamic assessment, we would like to dissect the hemodynamic to its basic uh, parameters to direct us to the best uh, approach uh, to the patient, uh, because we wanted to know whether the problem is a preload, contractility, afterload, the systemic vascular resistance, because each one of these will need a, a different approach in the management. When do we use uh, the invasive monitoring or less invasive monitoring in ICU? Again, another dilemma in ICU, it required uh, a conference reports and expert panel. Uh, this is from 2016. Uh, these uh, renowned people uh, in the field of hemodynamics uh, got together and suggested this flow chart when you are dealing with acute circulatory uh, failure. So they said, really, for all patients, you need to have clinical assessment, uh, central venous pressure, uh, lactate measurement, echocardiography as it's non-invasive and commonly or widely available nowadays, and arterial catheter. By these, you, will, you can measure the CVP, the oxygen venous oxygen saturation, the CO2 gap, and then you can uh, also assess uh, various parts of the circulation. Now, if that wasn't enough, uh, or if your patient has got uh, ARDS, then probably you need invasive tools at this stage. So if there's no ARDS and your patient is improving with the initial therapy using these, uh, these levels of monitoring, then that's fine. Continue with the same more dynamic monitoring till resolution of shock. But if your patient has got insufficient response to initial therapy, or if your patient has got ARDS, then here you would need to use advanced hemodynamic monitoring device something like transpulmonary thermal dilution or pulmonary thermal dilution, i.e. the pulmonary artery uh, catheter, especially when there is a RV failure. So practically, you need minimal, uh, the minimum for hemodynamic monitoring, clinical assessment, lactic acid, A-line, CVC, and echo. Uh, then on top of that, if your patient shock is improving, then Hopefully, you don't need to proceed further. You can just rely on the on the first line of assessment, if you like. But if your patient's shock is not improving, then probably you would need to have an uh, advanced monitoring device. As we said, uh, one of the transponent from a dilution device, let's go, or uh, PA catheter. Or if your patient has got shock associated with ARDS, then again, the panel recommends that you have advanced hemodynamic monitoring device. Or if your patient has got right ventricular failure, then the ideal uh, tool here would be the PA uh, catheter. Uh, another um, indication for advanced hemodynamic monitoring device, uh, when you have conflicting therapeutic goals, you have AKI and you have pulmonary edema, ARDS, you want to dry out the patient, but at the same time, the kidney is struggling and you want to get the right balance, then probably you should use the uh, advanced hemodynamic monitoring device. If you have an undifferentiated shock state, so you think your patient, you thought initially that he's hypovolemic, you you replenished the tank or you filled the patient up and still they are not responding, they lactate, not improving, then probably the patient is suffering with undifferentiated shock, i.e. there's more than one type of shock 
uh, going on it. And here, probably, you, your patient would benefit from having an advanced hemodynamic monitoring tool. Uh, during major operations uh, for intraoperative optimization, um, liver transplant, uh, high pick, really major abdominal surgery, there's good evidence to suggest using advanced hemodynamic monitoring devices would help these patients. And finally, in some arachnoid hemorrhage patients, because we know the best preventer of delayed uh, ischemia is having euvolemia. For these patients, it would be ideal to, to hook your patient to one of these advanced hemodynamic monitoring devices. Right, uh, moving on to the non-invasive hemodynamic uh, assessment. Uh, and I will start with the esophageal Doppler monitor or the ODM. It's a, a British device, and that's why they always write, it, write the esophageal with the O. Uh, this uh, beautiful device is really like uh, uh, an NG uh, tube with a probe uh, at the tip of it directed uh, backwards to the aorten. Uh, it sits in the lower part of the esophagus and it will detect the flow of the uh, red blood cells uh, in the aorta. So this is the, 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 the tube and that's the tip of it. You can see here it's sitting. You can insert it either nasally or orally. It's commonly used in Britain uh, for post-op patients. Uh, it will give you the following data. So you'll see that um, most of these devices that we're going to talk about today will give you or dissect your, uh, your patient's hemodynamics to its basic elements. The preloads will give you reflectors of preload. So it will tell you about the stroke volume. It will give you something called the corrected uh, flow time. Uh, and it will give you the stroke volume variation. Uh, it will give you reflectors of contractility, and it will give you an idea about the afterload as well. The advantages is non-invasive, so you are not pricking the patient. It's just like an NG tube. Uh, it's a bedside, and it gives you continuous uh, data. The problem with it, though, it's operator dependent. Anything ultrasound related would be operator dependent, and this is uh, no different. It um, needs recurrent adjustment because your patient uh, with the positioning, the, the probe might move. Uh, it's not ideal for awake patients, so really your patient should be sedated to tolerate this. And unfortunately, it cannot be used with inter-aortic balloon pump and uh, esophageal or aortic pathology uh, or if the patient underwent uh, upper uh, GI surgery. Uh, here we'll have two scenarios. So this just to show you the screen. Uh, of the patient. So here is telling me that the stroke volume is low, 39. The cardiac output is 3.66, also on the low side. And the corrected flow time is 256. Uh, the normal is 330. So all these uh, suggest to me that my patient has got uh, hypovolemia. Uh, on the other hand, if you see that the cardiac output is high, and you can see the stroke volume in the higher side as well, and the corrected flow time is widened, so it, it's, there's taking longer for the blood to, to go through, or the, if you like, the pulse contour is wide, then this would suggest to you that there is vasodilatation and uh, what you see in the distributive uh, shock. Uh, using the uh, esophageal Doppler monitor, a stroke volume variation of 13% was found to predict fluid uh, responsiveness. Uh, this screen here that you can uh, edit it yourself. So there's more numbers out in the background. You can uh, pop it up in these uh, uh, empty boxes. Right. So that's the esophageal Doppler monitor. I've used it uh, quite frequently when I was in training in England, and I always found it a quite helpful tool, especially in major uh, surgeries. Uh, actually, quite often people uh, in anesthetists would insert, it, would insert the tube or the probe intraoperatively and transfer the patient to you with the probe uh, in situ. Uh, moving on uh, to the echocardiographic dynamic assessment of hem hemodynamic status. And here we will talk about the left ventricular outflow track and velocity time integral or LVOT VTI. Uh, I must say I have a disclaimer. Uh, 
I usually give this session to my colleagues, especially in our practical session. When we do the echo session, I always have one of our echo techs to, to teach uh, this session uh, as I'm not as good as them uh, in, in, in echo. But I'll try my best to uh, convey the message on how we use the the echo to to calculate the uh, left ventricular outflow track and the L and the VTI. So really, uh, this is the um, if you like the left ventricular outflow track. It's usually fixed, and what you need is to calculate the cross sectional area here because you will need this for the calculation uh, of the cardiac output. Um, so you have this equation cross sectional area. It's just like any circle, it's the uh, diameter squared times the pi divided by, by four. And that's the, usually the machine will give you this number. Uh, if it is an echo machine, obviously, mm -hmm. then you don't have to fiddle with the numbers uh, or know the equation and go through it uh, yourself. And uh, we know that stroke volume equals the alveoli cross sectional area times the uh, LVOT VTI, which is measured in centimeter. And here we have the cross-sectional area, as we said, that's the equation for it. Then you have the LVOT uh, VTI. And, and to measure the VTI, uh, you need to get the five chamber view and get your probe across the uh, outer flow. And then you will get uh, this, this shape. And because we know the uh, cross-sectional area, and in addition to this area, uh, you can uh, calculate the VTI. Um, we know that cardiac output is stroke volume times uh, heart rate. Uh, and to calculate this, are just illustration of the how to generate uh, the VTI. Uh, again, I borrowed these uh, pictures from our Ecotech. And the normal range for a VTI is really 18 to 22 uh, centimeter. Uh, numbers below this suggestive of depressed cardiac uh, output. Uh, and this is an example of calculating the cardiac output. So if the uh, LVO uh, area is 3.7, the VTI is 20, uh, then the stroke volume would equal the product uh, of these uh, two numbers. So your patient would have 77 ml.5 ml stroke volume. Time it by the heart rate, which was 80, then you get a cardiac output of 6.2. Uh, uh, all uh, new machines will give you these numbers uh, automatically as you complete uh, the tracing. Obviously, the advantages of ECHO uh, are non-invasive hemodynamic assessment at the bedside, uh, uh, allowing also to differentiate different causes of shock. Quite often, we put the ECHO on the heart and we discover the patient is not really uh, as we thought, we might discover there is a pericardial tamponade uh, present or, or compromising the circulation. Uh, a friend of mine the other day uh, diagnosed a, a massive uh, PE uh, using the, the echo. So um, the echo can be very helpful in finding different etiologies uh, of shock. And give you, obviously, direct estimates of measurements, including stroke volume and cardiac uh, output and will assist the other parts uh, of, of, the, of the heart. Uh, as we said yesterday, uh, don't rely only on ejection of fraction because uh, from this study, we know that quite significant chunk of patients who had diastolic heart failure, they had uh, good uh, or adequate ejection of fraction. However, their cardiac index uh, was quite low. So this uh, concludes the non-invasive tools of assessment, uh, usually the echo or the esophageal Doppler. I'm not sure if you have the esophageal Doppler machine uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, as I said, it's a, a, a device that was invented by uh, Professor Mervyn Singer, one of the uh, renowned uh, physicians in ICU. D do you have it in? Uh, in I, I, I had made of it. Meet with him. He's a very renowned professor. Oh, Professor Mervyn Singer. Yeah, yeah. Marvin Singer, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, from UCH, uh, University College of uh, uh, London. Uh, 